The American Meteorological Society's policy program is supported in part by a public-private partnership. The availability of this lightning information actually paints a very different picture of risk to Norman, to a venue, to whatever it is that is your asset here, but only with the lightning data does it change your, your situational risk. Uh, Dr. Claisel is an associate professor in the College of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences at the University of Oklahoma, and he's the university meteorologist in the OU Office of Emergency Preparedness. He's also a weather safety instructor and a member of the Governor of Oklahoma State Hazard Mitigation Task Force. Dr. Lazel. All right. A long time ago when I was giving presentations, uh, somebody said, you know, if you could do your presentation in one slide, what would it look like? Um, and trying, you know, to eliminate all of those things. This is that one slide. Uh, the University of Oklahoma is well known for its meteorological expertise, but this is the University of Oklahoma's football stadium. And those are people in that stadium, and this is not a photoshopped image. Uh, we have a long way to go, and, and it was mentioned, Scott mentioned, that I don't use the word thunderstorm with, uh, with the folks that I deal with now in the emergency management realm. I use the word lightning storm. I try and take it directly to the hazard, because if you say thunderstorm in Oklahoma, that goes in one ear and out the other. Thunderstorms are sort of ubiquitous with Oklahoma, and so you don't really ever internalize the risk. So at the front end of being a meteorologist my entire career, but now morphing into an emergency manager, uh, I get to see the other side of how we have communicated these things from the meteorological side to the emergency management side. And so that leads me to the role, and I'd like to at least give you a little bit of, of info about what I do. Um, a university meteorologist is a, is a new position. There are only a few uh, of us out there. The University or Northern Illinois University, Gilbert Sebensti, if, if you're aware of that name, he's been doing it for a while. Troy Kimmel at the University of Texas, Ed Benzman at Notre Dame. There are a handful of universities out there who now have on staff a meteorologist who is providing direct and daily support to university operations. And that's not only venue protection, but all the way out uh, to looking at potentially long-term forecasting uh, for power. Uh, that's a lot of money at a campus. And of course, lightning impacting the, the utility part of, of what we do. Uh, power outages are a big deal. Computing outages are a big deal. We have operational elements of the National Weather Service on our campus. We can't take down the Storm Prediction Center because of a lightning hit on our campus, for example. So what a university meteorologist and what I do is I do hazard and safety forecasting for events. And those are all kinds of events, whether that's the Greek community having rush or whether it's uh, athletics or whether it's the 41,500 students on our campus during the summertime for camps, sports camps, cheer camp, dance camp, all of these outdoor things. And we have students on our campus who do not know what the buildings are, right? They're not internalized to where to go. So they have to be sort of handheld. So you have to train uh, the individual camp counselors and those kinds of folks. Uh, I do education and training for students, faculty, staff. We go to faculty meetings. We go to student, or student organization meetings, uh, the Greek community, residence halls, uh, every place we can go to sort of begin this process of learning about everything from uh, severe weather annexes. Uh, what is an annex? It is your emergency operations plan for whatever the hazard might be, whether that's lightning, whether that's tornadoes, winter weather, like we just had a cancellation on Monday due to winter weather on our campus. Uh, Building evacuation and sheltering plans, as well as the actual sheltering decisions, uh, as well as direct event safety support. We then permeate all of that information through social media. We have Twitter feeds, we have Facebook feeds, we have a web page, we have you know, all of these things where students, faculty, staff can go for direct information as it pertains to our particular campus. So it's in that vein that I want to talk to you about lightning information today. So I want to highlight a couple of things here. One is the intersection of lightning and people. That's not new. 
Right? We're here today in, in 2014, but this is an issue that's been written about uh, in the literature for a long period of time, this intersection of lightning and venues, whether it's in our meteorological research literature, whether it's in things like campus safety, the bulletin of the AMS a decade ago had an article. This isn't new. Lightning kills. We've established that with, with our previous two speakers. Uh, but the last two things is the current state of venue protection from weather, and that's both with and without lightning data. I'm going to take you through a little bit of an audience participation activity here shortly. Uh, I love to do audience participation, even if you're not an emergency manager or a meteorologist. I love to put people in the uncomfortable role of being the meteorologist or the emergency manager. So we will do that, as well as close with some advice for some successful practices. I mentioned this isn't new. Uh, there are resources available out there that you can go to, like I said, it, whether it's the Bulletin of the AMS or whether it's our journals, whether it's the health journals, uh, disaster journals, emergency management journals. The one thing we've really never done is we've really never synthesized all of this information into a single repository. That's something that the university meteorology community, myself, Troy, Gilbert, uh, we're putting together. We've all gotten together and we're getting together virtually and we want to put together at least a library of resources that can be used nationwide as people begin to think about the risks to campuses, venues, etc. We have been doing for three years a venue training course in Norman for a variety of people, universities, venues, and you can see that uh, it's in partnership with the International Association of Venue Managers. That's one place where the meteorology community has kind of been slow to embrace is there are other professional societies out there that deal with lightning on a daily basis and they don't really have the meteorological expertise. And we have the meteorological expertise, but we don't know anything about venues, decision making, crowd control, and whether that evacuation decision is going to make people mad or not. You know, people paid a lot of money to be at that game or at that concert, and they expect the delivery of entertainment or sporting event or whatever the case may be. And now you're telling them they have to leave? You know, what if that's a vacation for four and they've been wanting to go to Wrigley Field for forever? I mean, there are social science ramifications to each one of these lightning decisions and sheltering decisions that we might make with a venue. But you can see there's staging companies, there's universities, there's convention and visitors bureaus. We had all the Tulsa Drillers, that's a baseball team. Uh, we worked with the uh, Final Four, the Georgia Dome, you know, some of these large places. Uh, we, so it was so successful the first year that we did it again in 13. Um, and this was when my son thought dad was cool. For the very first time, I was quoted on ESPN's website. And for the meteorologist to have a quote and dad to have a quote on the ESPN website, I was finally cool to my son. We were able to host the NCAA, the National Football League, the Country Music Association, a lot of people now interested in lightning. The problem is, why do people get interested in lightning? Is it because, wow, we need to be proactive? No, mm -mm, something bad happened. If you look at almost every one of these people, something bad happened. Something bad happened to them. It's why they're there. As we went into 2014, suddenly we started getting into the box stores, Walmart, Home Depot, Target, uh, and they're realizing that, wow, if we've got you know, things going on outside, they've all got people at the front door. If there's a thunderstorm outside and there's cloud to ground lightning, do we turn our shoppers loose into the parking lot? And what do you think this is being driven by? What do you think those decisions are being driven by? It's liability, right? People are now understanding, like Sugarland did when the Indiana Fair stage collapse occurred, that suddenly you are liable for the safety of your patrons, just like I'm liable for the safety of the students and faculty and staff of the University of Oklahoma. And when people begin to internalize that, now suddenly these data sets become absolutely critical to the things we do. The National Weather Service is a fantastic repository for all of the information associated with lightning fatalities and lightning risk. They've done a fantastic job. If you've never met John Jensenius, uh, John has just been unbelievably grateful in providing information about risk to the community. And that's not only in the way of fatalities, but what is your risk of being struck? And you know, we've talked about the 32, 33 deaths or the 300 injuries and those kinds of things. Uh, but the odds of being struck in your lifetime is about 1 in 12,000. Okay, that's not a big number. And you think, wow, 1 in 12,000, I'm, you know, that's not too terrible. Well, think about 1 in 12,000 if you're dealing with a venue of 100,000 people. 
or 200,000 people if you're talking about a NASCAR race course. You know, now suddenly you're talking about the possibility that multiple people have been struck in their lifetime and then that has impacts family and, and onward. So I would highly recommend that you uh, take advantage of the lightning data that is at the National Weather Service's lightning site. Uh, these are each of the fatalities, all 26 of them. Um, and one of the things that, that I didn't get a chance to do, but I let Donna Franklin do this. Donna Franklin at the National Weather Service always ends her presentations with a picture of each of the individuals. It internalized. Anything you can do to internalize the risk um, for people to make better decisions is a good thing. But these are the 26 people so far uh, that have died in lightning fatalities. You heard about the, uh, the lightning fatalities at Rocky Mountain National Park. And one of the things that, you know, the, the LMA in this particular case with Washington, the wow, it's been thundering for I don't know how long. Uh, this is absolutely consistent with every lightning fatality story that you see. It's always, there were no warnings at the time. There were no, so no warnings were issued on the storm. Um, which one of these is the little light? The top one, thank you. Uh-oh, that one. So you see, uh, Lightning strike, no warnings issued on the storm by the National Weather Service. Uh, the one in Austin, which is recently from this past summer, which is uh, soccer kids, again, no warnings, out of the blue, et cetera. Why is it that every time we see an article about lightning, it talks about the thunder, but it talks about the lack of warning? Lightning is one of those hazards that comes with a free and audible warning system associated with it. And the connection between lightning and thunder escapes a lot of people. It did in the, in the Rocky Mountain. They didn't associate thunder with risk. And that's on us from an education standpoint. And it's particularly on us when we're dealing with venues with hundreds of thousands of our friends that have no idea about this connection between thunder and lightning, as strange as that may sound. So we have to do a better job of education, but we also have to get emergency management and emergency preparedness out of this realm of an expectation of a formal warning from the National Weather Service, because what they're talking about here is a severe thunderstorm warning. There wasn't a severe thunderstorm warning issued. If you talk to the individuals, that's what they were expecting. Well, if it's not gonna be a severe thunderstorm according to the meteorologist, then I don't have to worry about it. And many emergency preparedness people are stuck in this mode of warning being issued or the other tool that now has become part of the emergency management daily activity is radar. You know, it wasn't in the pretty colors. Like you said, that lightning bolt started in pretty colors but wound up on the ground somewhere else 10 miles away. And those are the things we have to be able to communicate. These are the ones that keep me up at night. Now we have not, to my knowledge in our digging, had a fatality on a university campus in Lightning. But it did happen this year in Canada. We're at, in Waterloo, a student was struck and killed on the campus, and I s note several things for you. Um, the school canceled events when, in the wake of the lightning strike, and advised students on Twitter to seek shelter from the storm. So after the fact, you get please stay indoors or head to the nearest building, et cetera, et cetera. Here's one from a student. I felt the electricity charge on the way to, to the library. I put away my umbrella. Whether that's legit or not, I don't know. Whether that's a reaction to, oh my gosh, somebody got killed and oh, that's what that weird feeling I was. You just never know that. But I will point out that even in Canada, there were no severe weather watches and warnings in effect at the time of the strike. Nor will there be. But there's an expectation out there that there will be, otherwise they're not at risk or they don't internalize the risk. So this is where audience participation begins. This is 3 p.m. in central Oklahoma on Friday the 13th, April 2012. I've highlighted Oklahoma City, I've highlighted Moore, I've highlighted Norman. In the emergency management realm, radar is absolutely key and this goes back to the modernization of the National Weather Service and all of the data providers that got together and said, we need to make this wonderful Doppler radar data available. And now emergency management agencies all over this country use radar as a primary tool of assessing risk. It is their primary weather situational awareness tool. What's second on that list? It's the warnings. 
Am I under a severe thunderstorm warning? Am I under a tornado warning? The watch warning process, that's number two. So my question is, is if I had this huge storm out to the west of Norman on an April day where we know that storms tend to move from southwest to northeast, and you are the emergency managers in Oklahoma City, more or like me, having to cover the OU campus in Norman, how would you be internalizing your risk at this point? Go ahead, shout it out. If I'm in Norman, do I have anything to be worried about? Don't say yes. Why do you say yes? Because you're insider trading, <laughs> right? You're insider trading here. A storm moving from southwest to northeast, of course, Oklahoma City is obviously under the gun here. More, because more is more, you're under the gun if there's a storm within any distance of you. But in this particular case, there's not a whole lot going on in Norman, and maybe we might get some rain, but that storm's headed. And of course, there is the current warning at the time. So here is the severe thunderstorm warning. That's the shaded area. Notice that none of these locations are in the warning. So these are now on the screen, the two primary tools that emergency managers and venue protectors utilize for venue safety, for asset safety, et cetera. It is radar data and warning data. That's it. And if you need proof, check out the most grossing iPhone apps. What I've done is I've circled in blue the ones that provide real-time radar. The ones that are in red are the alerting ones, and many apps do both. But it's most of the list of the top 24 grossing apps. People download it. Why? Because they provide you with warning information and radar information. And people now have this information on their phones to be able to protect their assets, whether it's a venue with a ton of people or whether it's an oil and gas pipeline or whatever the case may be. This is how emergency management and public safety is primarily done in the weather realm. It's radar and warning information. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about area one and area two. What can you tell me about your risk in area one as this storm now advances off to the north and east? You're in a warning, but what would you be thinking about your trend of risk in that region? It's decreasing. What about area two? You are not in line of the storm track line that the television stations have now drawn for this storm, which is taking it directly to Oklahoma City. You're kind of over here on the fringe, but I'm guessing if you want to participate, and I don't want to put words in your, your mouth, but in number two, would you assess your risk as greater in two or greater in one? Greater in two. Greater in two. What if I put the lightning data on this in addition to the radar data? and the warning data. Now, what do you think about your risks in region one and region two? Vote from the blue. Lightning in non-precipitating regions is a huge deal. When you start looking at these fatalities, most, if not all, of these fatalities are lightning in areas where it is not pouring down rain. Because in pouring down rain, people usually have the sense to do what? Go inside. Again, they are forced by their environment to make a good decision. But when they are not being precipitated on, they are not under this big, huge blob of pretty colors, okay? They tend to not make the same decisions. And in this particular case, I would argue that the risk in area one is equal to or greater than the risk in two because you have a whole lot more lightning going on even though you're outside of the core, which also, you know, we talked about earlier showing up drafts and, and lightning jumps and things like that. That's, that's there too. But now think about Norman. If you were in Norman, what do you know now about your situational awareness with the lightning data integrated versus the earlier image that I showed you when Norman was kind of off to the side and out of the way, except Daniel, who cheated. So here I am at OU, and at this point I was thankfully not the university meteorologist. <laughs> but what you're going to see in the next 30 minutes is why the University of Oklahoma has a university meteorologist. Here goes the storm cruising up to the north and east. And so what I'm going to ask you is, I have removed the warning. So obviously this was the area of the warning and now it's time for a new warning from the National Weather Service. Is Norman in or out of that warning? In, out, hands, show of hands. How many of you think out? Yeah, so it's pretty much unanimous. And you are absolutely correct. 
So here's the new warning. Clips more in Oklahoma City. Here's Norman right down here in the OU campus. But notice with the lightning data attached that we still have this huge risk of lightning, and it is now 320. So note that the new National Weather Service warning does not include the OU campus, which means nobody's weather radio has gone off. It does not include either of Norman's two high schools, none of the four middle schools, nor 17 of the 18 elementary schools. It actually clips one far north elementary school, so their weather radio goes off. The other 20 plus campuses in Norman, no weather radio. Doesn't go off. You're not in the warning. But look at the amount of lightning. And oh, by the way, what happens around 3.30 to 3.45 every day on Monday through Friday in this country? School lets out. So here's my concern, because the, ability, uh, the ava availability of this lightning information actually paints a very different picture of risk to Norman, to a venue, to whatever it is that is your asset here, but only with the lightning data does it change your, your situational awareness. It doesn't change your situational awareness if you're just using radar and just using warning data, which are the standard these days. There's also something called the 30-30 rule, and if you've heard of the 30-30 rule, it's essentially a six-mile radius. So here's the six-mile radius of OU. Do I need to stop any activities? If I have a policy that says I will abide by the 30-30 rule, just like the NCAA does, just like the AAU does, just like the Olympics Committee does, etc., am I stopping any events that are currently ongoing in Norman right now? I should, though, shouldn't I? You're nodding like I should. But that answer, I don't care about this right now. The 30-30 rule only cares about that radius, and there is no lightning in that radius, which means even though from the radar data I can see that I'm going to be missed, and from the warning I see that I'm going to be missed, and I don't have lightning information until something tells me that it's going off in my 30 mile, because now I've heard thunder, I haven't canceled anything here. Yet with lightning data attached to this situational awareness, I can make a very different and much more safe decision for the venues in this case. And of course, the 30-30 rule, we spent how long trying to get this sort of into the vernacular of everybody from kids to adults? We busted our butts to get that 30-30 rule out there. I mean, even wrote kids' books to get the 30-30 rule ingrained in our education. And now we're finding out that it's not going to cover us. It's not accurate. Now, how do we undo that, right? We spent a lot of time and energy trying to socialize this with our schools, with outreach, like you've talked about, and now we've got to go back and say, oh, well, we might need to change that. 3.30, lightning is now within six miles of the University of Oklahoma campus, which means at this point, we would like to be thinking about canceling things, but at this point in time, even though this is the wonderful Earth Network's total lightning data, we didn't have access to this information on the campus, even though we have weather decision technologies on the campus. The mismatch between the academic community and the private sector. We weren't talking to one another as much as we needed to be. And as you said, Norman Public Schools. What time is dismissal? 3.40. I think it's awesome that their slogan for the busing is be responsible, use safety, and show respect. And right about now is 345, and school dismissal is in progress in Norman, 15,819 students. And remember that OU classes are about to let out at 350. That's another 24,000 students outside going from class to class. And now look what is going on. Are we in the warning? No. Do you now know why every one of these lightning fatalities says we weren't in a warning? It wasn't even raining. Boy, I heard a lot of thunder. We have to start an educational process as it pertains to people that run venues, as sporting events, NASCAR, Major League Baseball, you name it, whatever that is, and we have to do a better job. And oh, by the way, this is four o'clock. And oh, by the way, did you see sort of the ramp up of lightning in that process? We talked about a lightning jump earlier. And now there's a new shade on the map. It's an orange one, a dark orange one. That's a tornado warning. And this is now our six mile radius. Remember what it looked like 20 minutes ago? 
How long do you think it would have taken to evacuate a stadium of 90,000 people or a high school football stadium of 15,000? Or if this had been the Texas Motor Speedway down the street, you know, down I-35 from us in Fort Worth, 220,000 people? The tornado and the severe thunderstorm warning times, four lead times and things like that are great for a family of four. But 13 to 16 minutes doesn't cut it for a venue. But with the use of lightning data, you can actually see the risks much more quickly, much more efficiently, and can make decisions much more rapidly than waiting around for a warning. That's our tornado coming into the west side of town, associated with that lightning jump that you guys talked about a little while ago. And this particular tornado carved a path that actually hits three schools, a middle school, an elementary school, and a high school where my daughter was. EF-120 injuries, thankfully it was an EF-1. The timeline, NPS dismissed their buses at 3.40, or the dismissal, school dismissal was at 3.40. The buses left from 3.50 to 3.55. The tornado developed at 3.59. This is our worst nightmare, and we got away with it. 20 injuries, no fatalities. We got away with one. We're not going to be that lucky every time. I mentioned the lightning safety information that is available, not only to individuals, but to venue managers. It's at lightningsafety.noaa.gov. And the National Weather Service has taken a very leadership role in this area. They have a number of, of educational materials as well as toolkits, and even toolkits specifically designed for things like golf courses and for uh, venues. That's all there. They have started a program of recognizing safety uh, for venues, but I kind of got a little put out when I saw this list because I saw Major League Baseball. So these are the recognized venues and organizations who have implemented the Lightning Safety Toolkit. And I was hopeful that Major League Baseball had done this after July 6th. Because if it was before July 6th, I would lead the campaign to get Major League Baseball off of this list. And here's the reason why. I am a very average, just, I'm a baseball nut. And so a lot of the things that I do in the research realm is, is lightning and baseball and things like this. Back on July 6th, I'll read you the story from ESPN. David Price allowed a home run to start the bottom of the ninth inning. And that was only the beginning of his problems as he tried to close out his win. Rain began falling steadily at Comerica Park. Streaks of lightning flashed in the sky behind center field and loud thunderclaps accompanied the Tampa Bay All-Stars' pursuit of a complete game. It was crazy. I wasn't really looking up, manager Joe Madden said. I was just trying to get David through it. That is the manager. Who has the responsibility of lightning safety at NFL games and or Major League Baseball? It's the referees and the umpires. Now, do you not think that they have enough to do? They've got to call the game. How can they possibly be monitoring lightning or proactively monitoring these kinds of things in advance? We have to begin thinking about venues and changing, putting weather safety focal points at those venues that have, just like the replay officials now, right? The replay official at the NFL goes to New York. They're sort of this overarching arbiter. Why can't there be a weather focal point that is sort of the overarching safety person that can then make that call on behalf of these professional sports franchises rather than allow it to be with the referee on the field or the umpire on the field. Those are the kinds of things we have to socialize in those organizations and try and enact change. Until we do, we're going to keep having fatalities and we're going to keep having issues because that's too many things for a referee or an umpire or something like that to take care of. What are in some of these lightning safety toolkits of radii? In other words, what's safe? Well, that's going to be different for each venue. And this is going to be a struggle for people like the NCAA and Major League Baseball and others. Because, for example, if it's a football game at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, God love them. But that evacuation is going to take a much shorter amount of time than Neyland Stadium in Tennessee or Ohio Stadium in Columbus when you've got 105 or 110,000 people versus 20 or 30 or 40. So if we use the exact same rules at all the venues, that's not going to be the right way to go. What if we implement a minimum standard? OK, so at a minimum, you need to use this. Then what are people going to do? They're going to minimum, going to do the minimum. We need to be looking at individual venues and customizing their safety plans for them. And that's part of what university meteorologists do, at least for our campus and our events. But I would advocate these kinds of things for every one of these venue-related uh, things where the public is involved. 
This is OU, OSU Stillwater, and the University of Tulsa. Those are the number of cloud to ground lightning strokes in the last five years within 15 miles of those three campuses. That's a lot of lightning. We are talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of five to six weeks worth a year. So now we have another problem. If you're warning constantly and you've got impacts five or six weeks of a year on events, you need to either start thinking about rescheduling events or changing scheduling, but you have to socialize that this is going to happen and happen a lot in certain areas. And in Florida, it's 10 times that. If we are going to accurately protect against the risk, we're going to have to start looking at scheduling and start looking at how we protect venues and start thinking about how we you know, get that information out, whether it's through a program or whether it's through an app on a cell phone. I was showing Bill earlier, the New England Patriots have an app on their, you know, that you can get the weather information specifically for the stadium during the hours of the game. That's a great idea because now people can be prepared. We are going to have a lightning issue on Saturday at our home football game in Norman. And we've already cleared all of that information through our emergency preparedness people. They're ready to go with what might happen because we've been able to, to do that in the lead up. There are tons of great things going on out there. There are new ways of sort of displaying the data and, and kind of using predictive capabilities. You talked about going, you know, the lightning going into, uh, into models and the ability to look at cones of lightning risk into the future and that is now being integrated with radar and with lightning data uh, into a variety of decision support systems so our private sector uh, enterprise like it weather decision technologies which is what we use uh, those are the kinds of folks that are now kind of putting this into the hands of people uh, but more importantly is individual customized inclement weather guidelines and procedures that are specific so that the coaches aren't out there in the, in the last inning trying to decide whether the game goes on or not. Those decisions all have to be made ahead of time. So the last slide I'll leave you with, um, these are the significant challenges that, that I have and that we all have when we're talking about trying to protect venues. One is the education. You know, undoing that there wasn't a warning and the pretty color mindset where you're looking on focusing on radar or waiting for a warning to make a decision. The detection capabilities, which you saw, are just proceeding rapidly and how we merge those data sets are going to be key to the protection of venues going forward. Forecasting. You know, first CG strike still kills more than any other. I mean, we still have a first strike issue and can we use this data or these data to actually do a better job forecasting. Then alerting, what is the right buffer radii of influence against the venue size, type of the crowd? Uh, is it likely larger than six miles, which is the current 30-30 rule? And will sports entities allow local policies that are different from venue to venue, which is what we advocate? Compliance, how do you get an event to stop and how do you get people to evacuate? Lightning safety is still at its root a social problem. And if I go back to that same baseball game on July 6th, and you should see the crowd reaction. Ooh, ooh, every time there was a lightning bolt and a large thunder. Ooh, and then they'd all applaud. And they do this in Norman, too. I mean, the worse weather, the better. You've seen it. Anytime you watch a football game this time of year, if it's snowing, what happens? First thing that happens, shirts come off, right? <laughs> they have to prove that they're hardy and they can withstand. And, and that's a mindset that will get you killed. It is. In the end, that is a mindset that will do harm. We have to figure out the social aspects. The bottom line though, lightning data is now an absolutely necessary item in public safety, in any public safety decision support toolkit. You can't do it with just radar and warning information. You just can't. I'll share one last story. I was coming back from Lawton, Oklahoma, giving a talk about venue safety and lightning. And I was driving back to Norman and saw this just amazing thunderstorm going on to my east. And so I had to park the car and get out and get my camera and my tripod and start taking pictures. Until what was left of my hair started to stand up. That bolt right here, and that's me. I don't do that anymore. Albert Ashwood, who is the director of public safety for the entire state of Oklahoma, said to me once, Kevin, have you ever seen a tornado? I said, yes. He says, I haven't. I said, what? You've been in this state for decades. You've never, and you're the emergency manager, the state emergency manager. He says, Kevin, I practice what I preach. 
That's why I've never seen a tornado.